No. Okay, they're not. They absolutely are not. <laughs> You're going to get this part because I probably went over the line in my humor there. Here we go. Clap <laughs> that hand. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 519 of the Dead Robot Society. I'm Terry Mixon. Joining me, Paul E. Cooley, the man with the plan. I have a plan? I, I sure thought you brought the hope plan. So. I thought I you brought the plan. I hope you've got a plan. You were supposed to bring the plan this time. It was on your calendar. Did you not see the calendar appointment? Well, I did bring a plan, but it's more like a pinky in the brain kind of plan. Oh, God. Or Baldrick and Black Adder. Yeah, gotcha. Where, yeah, what, are we, what are we doing today? We're taking over the world, Pinky. That is a terrible brain impersonation. You should be ashamed of yourself. I should. I totally, it's only been probably a decade. What are we going to do tonight, right? The same thing we do every night. Try and take over the world. That's much better. We'll run with that. <laughs> yeah, it still sucks, but it's better. My brain is not on point. I never got the Orson Welles shit down. I just never, never was able to do it. I hear meowling. You hear meowling? Meowling's That's always right. good. Screamer is most distressed that, that I'm back and have not given her the love that she would like because I've been gone for pretty much a week. I went to the 20 Books to 50K conference in Vegas, and it was a screaming hoot with 750 authors talking everything under the sun about writing, and it basically just really excited me got me all fired up to to get back to writing yeah it was a lot of fun a lot of fun at that conference a lot of things to to listen to a lot of people to meet i have found my tribe you feel renewed and energized and ready to go tackle the messes you've left in your wake yes i feel the urge to blow up things oh god surely isn't that's that, worth something isn't that every day isn't that every day you had the urge to just blow something up in a story? Well, you know, I'm not blow up things to like the level of the lady that blew up her, her wedding dress after her divorce was final that used 10 pounds of Tannerite. What? You didn't hear? That's a story that's actually going around the news right now. There's a video where uh, she shot the wedding dress. The Tannerite is, is something you use for reactive targets. It, it blows up when you shoot it, basically. And they sell these little targets that you can shoot and blow up with that. And so they bought 10 pounds of them to put inside this dress. And one of their friends that knows a lot more about guns says, that's an awful lot of Tannerite, like five times. And so they kept moving the shooting grades back. And it blew up so big that people felt the shockwave 15 miles away. Wow. Pretty damn serious. Blew up some windows and shit. I'm, I'm guessing... I, I, I don't know, but I'm it was apparently a pretty big damn explosion. I'm guessing ATF was not very happy about this. I don't know. I didn't. I haven't watched the video. I just just read the story that went along with it. It didn't mention the ATF coming to hunt them down. I'm pretty sure that's going to be a, a ne in next week's paper. <laughs> that's entirely possibly true. Here's a tip for you folks. Don't do anything you know is going to cause the ATF to come to your house. Yeah, that's usually a bad idea. It's usually a bad idea. Usually a bad idea. What I can say is that this last couple of weeks, I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but I've cleared the decks. All the little projects that I've had going on, little things that I had things, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do this other thing, all have been cleared off. I'm free to write the damn novel without a distraction. How the hell did that happen? That never happens. <laughs> You shouldn't have said that aloud. You ever see, um, oh God, what is that action adventure guy that, that did the train movies? Uh, he's gotten kind of roly poly in the recent years. The train movies. You know, was Steven Seagal. Yes. Steven Seagal. He was in one of these movies where he's in the past and he sticks a shotgun down in somebody's pants and, and shoots and then goes, I missed. I never miss. It must be smaller than I thought. So I, yeah, I've never, I never have this cleared up. So I'm sure something like that will happen. Maybe Steven Seagal will come in and attack me. Wow. No, I've got nothing. <laughs> I mean, I don't know well, what I, the hell you know what doing. I should write. I should write a, I should write a novel about 
a, an aging out of shape action star that has to hoist up his girth and, and go take care of business. I thought they already made that movie. They may, they may have, but what's worth doing once is worth redoing until basically the entire audience falls over dead. Is that the new plan for AMC's growth? Pretty much. I'm just, I'm just curious. <laughs> I have no idea, but to get back on point, <laughs> that would be I, nice. That would be a I new thing. I literally have somehow managed to do all the little bitty things and clear all the projects except for the novel off the decks. So for once, I'm ready to start a novel without a competing priority trying to get some of my attention. And that's very exciting. I'm finding the same thing as I'm working on my nano project. How far along are you word-wise in your nano project? Where am I? I'm at uh, 17K, so I'm, I'm a few K behind, but I had to kick evolution out the door. So that became the primary focus is getting that to the beta readers, getting it ready for beta readers. I'm sending all that shit out tonight. Well, that's so, okay. You know, I, I hear that Tabitha Haddix, one, one of our listeners, went ahead and patrons went ahead and joined Nano like yesterday. Yeah. So she's going to have her work cut out for her. Yeah, she's going to be a little busy. I'm already, I've been going over word count when I've been writing, so I'm not too worried about catching up. Like today, I've already written 2,700 words. I'm sure I'll get the more later tonight while this is rendering. But, um, it's it's very nice not to have something, not to feel pressured to do anything other than just sit and write. And of course, in two weeks when the betas are done, that will completely change. Then I'll have to go back and get back on the horse. So I'm going to try and get as much done as I can now before that the, the holiday crazy happens. They have already got Christmas tree stuff out. Don't dude, they know Thanksgiving is coming? Dude, they had Christmas stuff out in October. I saw a, a meme go by that had, you know somebody kicking Santa Claus into a pit going, this is Thanksgiving or maybe it was, it was Halloween. This is Halloween. Yeah. It was somebody from the Halloween kicking it in there, but that's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. More or less. We we've got this. Well, Christmas is just consumerism run rampant anyway. It just is. I, that's what it's become. So yeah, that's how, how all the retailers react to it is get it as early and as often as possible. In this case, it was Denny's. We went out to have Denny's oh, today, God. and they've already got the Christmas tree up. Yeah, I think what? the I think there are certain stores in the mall that try and play the Christmas music this early, and some of their employees are ready to kill other employees for putting it on. They should be. I completely agree with you. <sighs> Terry's got massive ADD today, in case you hadn't noticed. Well, when Minnie comes around looking for her love, there's only so much that can be done. One of the other things that that I can say about what's going on with me is book two of Humanity Unlimited, the audio version, is off to retail. It's actually been approved by ACX, so it'll appear within a couple of days. By the time you you hear this, it's not going to be so far away. That's awesome. I'm excited. I'm glad somebody is because I have to start narrating the Black Evolution very, very soon. And I have to do something like let server press know it's coming and, and um, we should start working on a cover soon. That's probably a good thing to let them know. Yeah. You think I should yeah, probably do that. I, I think you should make a note to yourself to do that because <laughs> if there's no cover, that's going to impact your sales. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try and push this one out in any kind of uh, my, my goal is to get it out by, by my birthday, which is, you know, three days before Christmas. So, I'm not really feeling all that time pressured right ho, now. Ho, 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 MF. Uh-huh. So as soon as I get uh, the beta stuff incorporated, then I can start recording before I even send it to Silver Press because the vast majority of their stuff is going to be typo-related anyway. Typo or format or formatting or something like that. And if I have to go re-record a spot, not a big deal. Another thing that's, that's come and gone is um, finished up what I was doing with Bound by Honor. For with uh, Glenn Stewart, it's come back from the um, copy editor. Changes have been accepted, and it's in the production process. It'll probably happen sometime at the end of the month or beginning of next. So, yet one more project cleared off the decks. Yay! Yay! At some point, I might actually clear mine, but I doubt it. I believe it's all just you know one of those weird happenings where 
the stars have aligned and the planets were in order and suddenly it just happened. It'll probably never happen again <laughs> because it sure as hell wasn't intentional. <laughs> I have so many projects in progress. It's just, uh, yeah, your Kanban board is probably, you know, a pit of despair. It is a pit of despair. The, uh, um, I finished evolution and my first thought was, um, I'm ready to write extinct extinction now because I'm really interested in what happens next. So that was a good sign. I think you should start writing. I, as soon as static is over or even while static is going, I might pick it up. You never know. Maybe one of those nights where I'm just feeling it and it'll be time to go explore some sewers. It was a dark and stormy night. No, absolutely not. For some reason, I had to add that to my dictionary today. It didn't recognize that. It didn't recognize absolutely fucking as a word? Yeah, absolutely not. It did not recognize that as a word. <laughs> Can't imagine why not. <laughs> oh, the joy of being a writer. It's always fun making up your own language. Yes, absolutely. All right, man. I think for this show... We need to dig down deep. We need to dig into that story and talk about the ocean that flows beneath the story. Subplots. 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 Say it isn't so. Hang on to your shorts and here we go. So, Paul, we talked about subplots when we were doing, you know, our last issue of Crazy, I think, maybe a couple of episodes back. But I wanted to dig into them in a little bit more detail because there's an art to getting the subplots that don't just don't totally derail your story. All right. So let's start out. So make sure we're all talking at the same place. Define subplot. Well, you've got your main plot, which is whatever you're right. If you've got a mystery going on, for example, a murder mystery, solving the murder is the main plot. Having your ex-wife show up in town looking to collect something from you that doesn't have anything to do with the main plot, that's a subplot. Something that distracts or perhaps in other cases may enhance the character development. Or provide even more obstacles for them to stumble over. Sure, that's what I mainly use subplots for. <laughs> you you know, I, I just see you as, as uh, when you're writing, it's like a big game of Donkey Kong. You're just sitting up there as the, the gorilla throwing the barrels down at the, at the, you know, the poor poor characters as they try and make their way up. I'm not that great at it yet, but I keep trying to remember anytime it looks like they need to succeed. I need to go ahead and start throwing barrels. That's what I do, but you do it with subplots. I kind of do. I, I, I throw other things that, that derail their attempt to get to the main plot by giving them something else that has to be solved first. Okay, now why would you do that? For me, it just adds a level of complexity to the story that I want to have. I don't want it to be, you know, you've got to go attack this base and do it. That's 20,000 words and you're done. If I want to have an 80,000 word novel, it can't be that easy. They've got to go ahead and solve a few things along the way and maybe pick up information or technology or knowledge that they have to have for the end game. That's what I use subplots for is to provide all the pieces that the end game needs. And if you're a gamer, this would be side quests. Sure. Side quest is another good way of putting it. And if you think about, I mean, I'm thinking about the, uh, uh, some of the RBG ish style games. If you go on the side quest, you actually get the whole story of what's going on in the world because the, uh, the characters, your, whatever your player character is, as you go through it, you're discovering pieces of what happened to cause this current situation or more information that might help you at the very end of the game. And you get that by doing the side quests. You get to upgrade your weapons and do all this other bullshit. Sometimes the side quests are more dangerous than the main plot, and, it's, and they're designed that way. Yeah, depending on how you go about it, sure. <laughs> depending on how you go about it, yeah. Hey, this dude, Dad, that's really going to help us uh, do this? Oh, we need to go get that. You know it's between here and that? It's one of those kind of situations. So subplots in uh, action thrillers can be used very, very effectively in that way to try and distract the, the characters, pull them off, 
have them almost get killed handling that mess and jumping back. Or if you're writing like uh, detective fiction, you think about uh, some things Michael Connolly does is is that there will be like three investigations going on at the same time. There's the one that's the main deal, and there's these two others he's kind of peripherally following. They may all three collide. They may overlap with one another. He may he may solve one in the process of solving another. But the thing is, it kind of it gets you more into what he's doing, how he's doing it, how he thinks, what he thinks, and who he's doing it with. And it really gives you a chance to get to know the character, like you said. But it does provide that that necessary part of it to just it, it, it lengthens the plot. It makes it more rich. And yeah, if you're going to write something more than a short story, you kind of need them. Another thing that I use them for is to bedevil my main characters. Yes, yes, yes. Subplots are always fun to make annoy your characters. For example, uh, one of the Empire books, I've got the two main characters. They are busy trying to find and rescue some of their fleet mates that have been taken prisoner. The other point of view characters involve people that are in this prison camp that are busy trying to break out of the prison camp so that their escape will completely complex, completely just derail what the main characters are doing because they say, okay, we can find them. We can go in a surgical strike. We can take them out. We can get our people. What do you, where are they? Where, where have they gone? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> what are they doing? Holy fuck. <laughs> and now we have the problem where everybody's trying to escape. Um, it got a lot more complex than that. Yes, I remember. <laughs> it added a whole layer of of trying to get things smoothed out that I loved writing that because when I'm writing two separate dis, dis separate things going on in one book at the same time, trying to get it all to come together at the end at the same time is just a true pleasure for me. It's disparate, what really makes it worth it. Disparate POVs that where you have where you have a team or a couple of characters that have been working together and suddenly they're completely split up. Even if they're on the same plot, you've now got two subplots because they're trying to make their way back to the main plot. And that's what you're doing here is you're basically taking them both on a detour and then putting them together at the end of the book which it sounds like you did not accomplish that not too long ago. You never got them back to the main plot. Uh, well, yeah, I, I kind of failed that one. <laughs> I, I introduced too many subplots and they were so exciting that I didn't discard them and that made the book too long. So I came up with a convenient place to end it. That was not actually a complete story. Bad, bad man. I've never done that. Human beings we learn from mistakes. So I can look back on that and go, yep, I'll recognize it when I have that particular problem coming around again. With subplots, sometimes they, they end up getting more interesting than the main plot. And I think that's usually because, uh, for discovery writers anyway, is as we go through this, we find new and different ways to make their lives hell by taking them out in the subplot, which may actually relate back to the main plot but here you get a chance to do all the crazy and then by the time you get back to the main plot in the end you're like wait a minute we already did all that stuff what do we do now to make it new <laughs> because it gives you it really gives you a chance to play because it doesn't interfere necessarily with what you've already constructed as as what you see the end game is by the time the subplots are are coming back together your end game may not actually resemble what you thought it was going to be when you started Right, and that's actually a good thing in a lot of cases. It's led, it has led me to a lot of happy accidents, which um, are wonderful when they happen. And that's what's good about being a discovery writer. The shitty part about being a discovery writer is that you don't always know when to hang it up with the subplots. So true. Terry will get within 5,000 words of the ending and think of three new subplots to put in the book. No, subplots at the end usually aren't mine. It's the final twists that, that'll eat me up at the end. Yeah, this goes back to consistency and tying things up. If you introduce those puppies, you have to, at some point, do your best to end them, even if for, they don't come back. <laughs> for subplots, 
the really good ones anyway are the ones where I have the characters that are stuck in the subplot looking off to the side and going, what the fuck is this about? <laughs> <laughs> they come back tangentially and they're like, okay, why is everything blown up and burning? And, and why are there a lot of wounded around? What ha- what the hell happened while we were gone? And the character that, that was gone says, I got tacos. And hands <laughs> them the bag. <laughs> See, I, I can't believe you're not writing more stories like that one. I need to write that one. <laughs> I got tacos. You could be ta- you know, tongue in cheek mercenary style. I got I brought tacos. Yeah. While there's forty two ships just kind of blown up in the in the background. Yeah. It's like um there's a scene from one of the naked gun movies where Leslie Nielsen is standing in front of this house that's on fire going, nothing to see here, move along, move along, and the house is blowing up, and people are running around like crazy. Those are so fun to write. Yeah, they are. Trying to have the characters keep a sense of normalcy when things are just rolling off the rails is always one of the very most fun things to do. You really have the opportunity to play however you want to play. When we're recording this right now, NaNoWriMo has just started, and I am having a lot of fun. I haven't found the plot yet. I know what the plot is. I haven't found my way there yet. But just spending time talking about the character has already given me a love interest, possibility, um, possible foils. And the the old uh, mentor routine, close friend kind of person. I've already started to assemble these people, you know, within the first three thousand words, even though they're not fleshed out or anything else. But immediately from who my brain assembled, I know the kinds of complications that are bound to ar- you know arise from having these folks together. My advice to you: do not slab the girlfriend. <laughs> I. S- I- Slab? Is that the new word? Do not slab the girlfriend. You, you know what that is, right? Uh, don't kill the girlfriend. Don't kill the girlfriend. Don't put her in the morgue on a slab. <laughs> don't slab the girlfriend. <laughs> I had this discussion with Glenn Stewart when uh, we were doing the very first couple of books in the, the Vengeance cycle or whatever whatever the name is that he calls it. Because in the initial book we went through, the main character's girlfriend dies very early on. And then as we're writing the second one, the girlfriend dies. And I'm like, you can't slab two girlfriends in a (laughs) row. That is not how this works. So I got him to agree and and we reworked things and and got the girlfriend to survive the events. But he was going to go right back to that same well. And that would not be a, a fun thing in a series to just have a character lose two love interests in a row. That, oh, that yeah. hurts that hurts a character real bad. And yeah, how how many times has is has uh um Harry done it? Um a couple, but one of the times he had to do it himself. This it is was true. Bad. Yes, it, it was, was bad. very bad. So you, you can get away with it. I think you just have to be it is something you need to stay as far away from as possible. And when he did it, it was spread out over many, many volumes. Okay. So a lot of time and effort and various things going on passed through Harry's life before those events happened. At the end of Closet Treats, I do some horrible things to the main characters. And I could get You're away with that because, because of the type of book it was and the way the ending went. I think both were warranted. They had it coming. No. this Yeah. Pretty much the universe said you had it coming because there's other things afoot that you don't know about. But in while writing this book and writing some of the other things I've been writing uh, lately that aren't of derelict of the black, the slabbing, as you call it, if it would happen, would be at the end where it belongs. It would not be early on in the story. It would not be early on in the story. So. I think that uh, that's that's one of those animals you really need to stay away from. The other part of the problem is you slab them too early and you've got no one for the character to relate to. That That's, that's a problem. <laughs> it can be a problem. Well, 
let me give you a little advice on how to have a character work through their issues like that. Okay. Put them on a mountainside with assassins. That always works for me. Terry, I like the way you write women, but not all of them need to have a 50 caliber sniper rifle or gauze cannon or whatever the hell it was she was using. In this case, I had to make up a weapon to take with her. A big old hunting rifle, an ancient slug throwing hunting rifle. So 50 cal 50 caliber deer hunting rifle, huh? More like an elephant gun. <sighs> we need to have a talk. Anyway. It was so fun. Yeah, it's, I know. You're grinning like a little kid. It's kind of what you do. <laughs> why why would one be a writer not to finish a story where they're just grinning like a like a fiend? If you're not grinning like a fiend when you write a scene like that, you're doing something wrong. Oh, I agree with you there. If you're writing that kind of stuff, yeah. If you if you can't sit back and cackle about what a sick person you are, then you've you've definitely done it wrong. I actually pulled a Pauly e. Cooley moment in this <gasps> and had the character do something that was so sick, the AI had to go, I think that was a little over the edge. <laughs> you do realize that was gratuitous, right? <laughs> Clap your hands. I've got to tell you. Oh, God. We'll be back. What a bastard I am. I'm going to say once again that everybody thinks I'm the one that needs to be medicated 24-7. Otherwise, I'll be, you know, killing people in the streets. You, however, have serious issues that need to be addressed. <laughs> everybody thinks you're the calm, nice one, nonviolent person between us. And I can truthfully say that's horseshit. <laughs> Utter horseshit. <laughs> Okay. But, you know, when the need arises, yeah, you have to be one to go there if it fits the story. You have to be able to go there. To fit I can't the story. write. I, I don't enjoy writing stories that are horror in the long stretch, but I don't mind putting characters in places where they do things that perhaps may be terrible, may be over the line, may be something that their friends could not relate to. That's a part of drama, period, of creating tension and things like that, is to have a character go too far or have their coworkers see that and wonder if it's safe to be around them, if it's somebody they can trust. And then, of course, you have the other side of it, which is the character who did this. Do they realize that they did it? And are they feeling guilty about it? Are they feeling okay with it? Or are they feeling conflicted about it? All that stuff adds tension to what the character is doing. And guess what? you got another subplot born. For those brief moments that I do use those kind of things in a story, those change the character. They Their effect upon the character is what draws me to them. I like playing with people's psychology. And when you put them into certain situations, uh, the prim and proper descend into the primal. And the folks that are primal will elevate themselves into something better. So that that's a lot of, of fun to place, a lot of fun to play with in that place. I cannot talk today because you have all that ingrown tension between people, complications, action, complications all the way through it. And psychological places are fun to play because you can give people hallucinations. You can have little voices saying things in their head and you can have them, you know, basically flashing back on instances and describe those and how they affect the character. And that stuff's interesting. It's interesting I, to us. I just wrote a note that is a Paul E. Cooley kind of note that people wouldn't suspect that I would write. Add more blood to end scene. You know, folks, I give you Terry Mixon. I mean, seriously, take him, please. <laughs> <laughs> what other kind of things do we need to worry about with subplots? Letting them get out of control. Sometimes a subplot like this conversation? can take over your story and not in a good way. It can drag you down a rabbit hole that you say, but wait, there's, there's the end. It's right over there. <laughs> and it pulls you away. And sometimes that's a good thing, but a lot of times if you if you let a subplot derail you, 
then you end up with a half a book. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling all too well. That well, that too was derelict. Um, I can see some su subplots becoming books in their own right, which happens all the time. You know, take people on a side quest. Well, here we go. And they, they go off on their own. And then they come back for the for the final mash or in the next book, whatever else, get back to the main plot. I think when you should avoid subplots the most is if you're or cut them off is when they start becoming a quarter of, you know, a fifth to a quarter of the book size. I think you may have done something wrong. There may be a bigger issue with the story in the way you're telling it. That would be alarm bells for me. In a way, that's a lot like characters for me subplots and characters i'll often write a story for we'll use empire of bones for example the first scene that i wrote was from jared's point of view and then i wrote the one from kelsey and she from that scene proceeded to take over the entire damn series <laughs> in my brain jared is a second well he's not a secondary character but he's he's standing behind princess kelsey and it's happened before in other things that i've written where I've written some stuff and then I write a new character arriving and suddenly that character takes over the damn book. Does that change? And that changes the overall tone of the series. Oh, hell yes. When I was writing under, um, when I was writing my erotica serial stuff, I wrote mysteries and I didn't bring in the character that became the main character until like chapter three, when she rides up, She's a cop. She rides up on a Harley motorcycle and proceeds to take over. And suddenly, okay, it's her story. <laughs> well, she is a cop in a mystery. Yeah, well, I didn't see her coming. Uh, I'm going to not well, say anything. I saw, it, saw it later, but I didn't see it with the start. I didn't see her appearance <laughs> being part of the story. Okay, thank you for clarifying that in terms of erotica. We appreciate it. <laughs> It was totally true. I thought that the, when I started writing it, I thought it was going to be one of those kind of mysteries where the non-police solve the crime. Then I had her arrive and she was so larger than life that she proceeded to take over the plots and become the main character. I can see that. I can see that very easily considering what happens at the end of the first book. Actually. I was talking about the mystery, not Empire. Okay, well, I'm flipping back to Empire. And I envisioned what was going to happen at the end of Empire when I started writing. I knew that was going to happen. I just didn't anticipate that Kelsey would become so vibrant and full of life before I got there. That's a good problem to have. I like it. But it's also true with subplots. You can write a subplot that just is so enamoring that it proceeds to take your main storyline and drag it off in directions you never anticipated. And occasionally that's a good thing, but it can be a bad thing if you don't really realize that it's happening. Sir, we're 14 degrees off course. We're about to hit an asteroid. Fuck. <laughs> the asteroid being the subplot. <laughs> I forget. There was a, a movie about a kid learning to play a video game so he could fight a war. You remember Last this one? Fighter? Last or, Starfighter. Or are you talking about uh, Ender's Game? I'm talking Last Starfighter. Okay. And so at the end of this, the alien ship is about to crash into a moon. What do we do, sir? We die. <laughs> That's pretty much your plot when, when you get yanked off course. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get back on course, though? It depends on how soon you realize that you've gone off the rails. Either... If you realize at about the halfway to two thirds mark that you're not going to get to the end, you need to start hunting for another ending fast, or you need to go back and revise a little bit to, to pull your secondary characters, pull that plot line a little bit back from where you are. If you get to the last quarter and that's where you realize you're fucked, you're fucked. I have no response to that. <laughs> also, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Hey, I, I was talking about mine. Uh -huh. I wasn't even talking about yours. I chose to do the split in Derelict 
And once I did that, I knew it was going to be a mess to try and bring everything back because of how much I needed to show. But I wanted to do both points of view from inside and outside mirror. Therefore, kind of had to do that. But I got lost because there were so many things I wanted to show you to get your to get the readers to start formulating some theories that I will confirm or deny later on that I needed to have all this set up. The only way to have it set up is for them to have to go through it. And that means, guess what? The subplots, though, if you're going to consider those, took the fuck over. Subplots are a way for the author to sit there doing the whole hand thing and going, I can't wait to show them this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could have removed everything about what was going on with the uh, with the ship outside with, with uh, on, on black, SNR black. I could have removed that entire portion. And Tomb, which I really considered doing, and Tomb still would have been 102,000 words of them just going through the ship. I could easily have done that. But then I was going to have a problem in the next book going, meanwhile. <laughs> you should have just blew up the ship and be done with it. <sighs> if I was a smart man, that's the way I would have written it. That's the looking, way I would have written looking it. Looking back on it, once they got over to the ship, if you'd have found a way to blow up black that would have probably worked out better for you in the long run. Yeah, in the long run, yeah. Would have, it would have closed off the series real fast. <laughs> I don't think so. I think you would have found a way to get where you're going now, but you'd have need to have them be picked up later. Yeah, okay, I got that. It's, it's, it is one of those points where you reach a, a pretty big decision, which is, do I need to keep going with this? Is this really a focus? Is this really a part of the story that I want to keep? And if it's something you can't cut, then you kind of already made your decision. If the rest of the plot hinges on some things you're discovering in this subplot, then it's really no longer a subplot. You've just taken a meandering way that's curving and, and slamming before you get back to what the hell it was they were supposed to do. I'm going to disagree. It can you can go be, ahead and disagree. It can still be a subplot that has critical elements that feed back into the main plot that you that you can no longer get rid of it. But it can still not be part of the main plot. Yeah, but I, th I, I I look at it this way. It's all, I look at subplots as if they're not tangled in the characters as they move just through the main story. If they're not just complications, but actual subplots. Subplots are messy. You can't, you can't count on them being totally isolated and separate events that are taking place wholly outside of the main plot. It's all going to be a devil's brew mixed together of things going on. And you're going to occasionally find some subplots that are affecting major elements of your main plot by what's going on. And it's still a subplot. Eh, yeah, I guess. Depends on what kind of story you're writing. It really does. Because the way I look at subplots is there's usually something going on in the main plot at the same time. It's not like the characters just take a complete detour. But I'm looking at it in terms of a of a story that starts up and then branches out like this and comes back together at the end. The way I see subplots, it's more like you've got, there's a commercial that I saw years ago where you've got a golfer standing there and you've got the golf announcer talking slowly and he's drawing back for the swing. And then a football guy comes in, oof, takes him out of the entire picture. <laughs> That's your subplot. <laughs> Can subplots be torn out and made into separate books? Oh, sure. If they become something so large that it's worthy of a book, you absolutely can go ahead and branch off. That's how I got my main characters separated. Their subplot became so so powerful in its own right that I had to explore it with those characters separated from the main. And now I've got to work on getting them back together. So does that mean you dismiss the other characters completely from that book once oh, they yeah. spread out? Oh yeah. They're, I think that um, back in Reconnaissance and Force, at the end of the book, the main characters ended up separated. So I've written the Terra Gambit and Hidden Enemies, both for separate groups going on simultaneously. Now I've got to go ahead in this next book and bring them back together. Okay, so and th those two books take place essentially on the same timeline, 
but the character but but in each book you're just focused on one group of characters and the other group of characters is not there mentioned at all in that book that's correct okay because right. in my universe if you're separated by enough space you can't communicate anymore in my universe too <laughs> so there's there's no talking back and forth so while the two events are happening simultaneously neither one really knows what's going on with the other group okay I think they don't, even, they don't even know that they're having a chance of coming back to bed together again. <laughs> so yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be a challenge bringing them back together again, because just like subplots at the end of a book, you've got to find a way to seamlessly tie it all back together. So it doesn't look like you've got a hand behind the scenes, moving things around. So that goes back to our conversation last episode about bridge novels. <laughs> Or in this case, bridge pairs of novels. Sure, bridge sure. pairs of novels. I think that that's where some of that comes in. I really want to write some sequels that are what's happening at uh, Trident before um, uh, SNR Black returns and finds everything the way they find it. I want to write those stories how that came to be, but I don't want them to be in the main book. Because they're not of the derelict crew, not uh, not part of SNR Black story, so to speak. But I still want to write those. But they're essentially, you know, they're they're parts of the main story in timeline, but they are completely separate. They could have been subplots just by somebody communicating, but that's not the way it worked out. Not the way it worked out at all. And there was no reason to kind of put that stuff into um, destruction because there's no reason to put it at the front of Trident, although I've considered it. <laughs> I'm listening to a set of uh, lit RPG books called Awaken Online. Yeah. And it, it starts off and writes two novels in the main sequence, and then it has a side novel with one of the characters doing a side quest off by herself, doing things that are going to impact the main series but the other two characters that are point of view don't come back into this. It's just her off by herself doing what she needs to do. And when she comes back, she's accomplished something that sets her up to help them in stuff going forward. And there's another side quest novel with a different character that I haven't yet gotten to. So it can certainly be done. I keep thinking of, uh, you know, graphic novels or, or uh, cartoon, uh, not cartoons, comic books where they'll put out like a one shot that goes along with this series that may have one of the characters may not. It just kind of, the, it may be the villain that's in the one shot who the hell knows, but they do that all the time and get away with it. Cause it's kind of fun. You get, you get to go see what was going on or what precipitated this other event that the characters are going through, but none of them are in it because they couldn't possibly have witnessed it. So there, there are ways you can convey to the reader that this is going on. And if it's something big where you have to let them know about a lot of things, you can write that side novel. No reason you shouldn't. Especially if it's living in your head. We're writers. <sighs> we need to entertain ourselves. We should write these stories. Yeah, yeah. So when I do things like mention other battles that these people have been through or some other nasty event, are those formally subplots or are they just threads that you've started barely and not really returned to i'm gonna go with the latter okay what happens when you write that book then it becomes its own side side story side <laughs> plot side quest <laughs> side whatever plot. you want to call side plot so we're dealing with universe you have the opportunity to take all these things and kind of plug them in however you want for something you want to write about that would have been taking place at the same time, would have taken before, take taken place before, or after, whatever. There's no reason why you can't do that with a new batch of characters if you don't want to mess with the main plot. I've been looking at some of uh, what Chris Kennedy and Mark Wandry have been doing in their Four Horsemen universe. And one of the recent books that just came out deals with a character that they killed off during one of the early books. And they decided, you know, what if he didn't die after all? What if he survived the events that left him off to the side? Here's what he's actually been up to. And this entire book fits into their main stop plot line, but it's dealing with the character that they had actually written out and left for dead. Okay. I could see that. 
I can so th- completely see that. There's absolutely no reason you could not go ahead and write a story in one of your universes about some character that you feel deserves the spotlight. Even if it's only for that one time. Even if it ends in a nuclear laser beam that incinerates them on the spot. Isn't that a little uh, gratuitous? If you can't be, if you, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. <sighs> Subtlety. That name is Terry Mixon. I just don't know anymore. That's where you have, you, you have the nuclear laser beam incinerate them and Kelsey standing back there going, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be that strong. Yeah, Marvin the Martian walk on. Thank you for finding my PU-38 modulator. Exactly. <laughs> I now have an unobstructed view of Mercury. That had way more firepower than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> or like Brent, Brent when, I, when we're playing, uh, playing Rocket League and he demos one of the bots because they're annoying him. I'm like, use your words, Brent. Use your words. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's like car parts flying everywhere. Huge explosion. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Things to say in a firefight. Use your words. Use your words. I like that idea, actually. I need to put that in a scene somewhere. So what else about subplots? You can have more than one going on at the same time. No. I know. It's hard to imagine. You can have your main plot. You can have a pair of side plots. You can have God, God help you. You can have four side plots going at the same time. I how, can't imagine how you would keep track of all of that, but you could do it. I, I I think another part of the problem is that if you have more than just a couple of characters, POV wise, you feel like you have to give these other people something to do. You feel like it because you've you've already you've already interested the reader in these people by giving them a point of view. So now you have to decide are they important enough to have their own little story going on at the same time? Which means more scenes, more possible subplots for that character while they're contributing to whatever. This is why books easily can get to 750,000 words if you're not careful. Why do I see a black novel in my head here where the monster is somewhere in a bank and you've got your SWAT team people busy working their way through the air system in this bank trying to to do whatever they're doing and one of the SWAT guys comes face to face with a bank robber in the same vent who's there to rob the place and has no idea anything black is going on and they're like oh I so don't have time for this <laughs> right now <laughs> you <laughs> scramble that way <laughs> Pretend we never saw each other. We shall never speak of this again. (laughs) I could totally see something like that, where you could then go back and write the story of the bank robbers, their robbery of the bank, and the weird behavior of the the police that they could not understand at all. Or worse, the weird behavior at the bank. Exactly. Stuff moving around, things disappearing. They never actually see the monster. No, they think the bank is haunted. (laughs) <laughs> they think the bank is haunted or something weird like that. You could totally write that kind of story oh, yeah. as a side novel, and it would be funny as hell for you to write, and your readers would just laugh their asses off. Yeah, I, I like the idea of having characters who have no idea what's going on, and they don't get really killed by it. They just witness it and think, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> They're just completely oblivious. And I really, I really want to do that in, in uh, uh, Extinction. I'll have a lot of fun with that because I want, I want these people to uh, just have no clue and not understand what the hell it is they're seeing. When you start writing Extinction, I want you to go ahead and stick a sticky note at the top of your monitor that says, hold my beer. Hold my beer. <laughs> 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 well, well, if they're in certain parts of Houston, that's entirely possible to happen. <laughs> That's entirely probable to happen. If you've got, if you, that's a different kind of side plot there where, (laughs) where, where you have people that aren't even involved with what you're doing. And suddenly you have a thread from a story that may not even exist. (laughs) This suddenly intersect into your story. Somebody it's like, it's like having a cameo by somebody else in your story. 
they're in the middle of their own story and plot. And suddenly you and them are face to face for at least just a brief moment going, huh, that's weird. And on you go. It's kind of like in um, um, Shaun of the Dead. There's the other group of people who look exactly like his group of people with just a couple of different variances, and they're walking by one another as one group is getting away from the from the uh, the craziness, and the other group's going back into the craziness. Yeah, and then you're like, I wonder what their story is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what the hell happened with you people? I want to know these things. I want to know what happened to them. They could easily have made another movie like that, which is the, those folks in it. It would have been probably would have been fun too. I Those? think we just we just found a way to write a story, you know, write three separate novels of events taking place close to one another, and the plots just keep impacting one another, and you're not really sure how they impact as you go along. Yeah, something happens like your character's walking down the street, and so there's a car crash over there with the ambulances and shit like that, and the character just kind of going, "What the? I wonder what the hell happened over there." Next book. <laughs> That would be a bear to, to make it actually work out the way you want. Some people have said they want the first three black books in order. There is no order. Oh, God. Yes, there is. But it would be tough to put together. But that means that the first, there'd be 35 or 30,000 words of one group of characters. And then it would start with another group of characters folding in between them. And then Outbreak would come in. So now you're reading all three books at one time. With the scenes cut up to temporarily match. What you need to have in yours is you need to have a whole lot of crazy shit that it's a miracle the, the characters even survived what was happening. Finally play itself out. And then you cut across to a bar. And sitting in the bar is an angel with a beer in its hand. Give me another one. <laughs> Again, why aren't you writing these kinds of stories? Because these things come to your head. They just jump into your head. They do. It's awful. <laughs> your guardian angel is drinking. Look at what you did. Yeah, see, there, there's another story from the guardian angel's point of view. Yeah, you could you could write the entire black of, of the guardian angel having to, oh, if I just change this one little bit right here. Maybe just barely it's going to miss. Oh, that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> the most incompetent guardian angel. Oh, that would be a story in itself right there. That's all I'm saying, man. You can make an entire <laughs> series of novels about the fuck up, you know, finally gets it right or mostly right in the end. <laughs> Has to go in for his job evaluation. He, he's like, the, he gets a call. How's everything going down there? Oh, everything's good. While his foot is busy shoving the body just a little bit, <laughs> a out little of bit view. further out of out of view, out of frame. <laughs> We're good here. <laughs> It'd be like the stormtroopers calling down to Han Solo. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Uh, how are you? Every, everything's good here. We're all fine here. How are you? <laughs> I love the Wentz Harrison Ford does in so, that scene. You could write. You could write a small short story of the stormtroopers trying to capture them and chasing them around the death star. Yes. And one of them talking about how, how he really needs to go back to his shooting range because yesterday he shot one of his fellow stormtroopers. <laughs> God, they sucked. Or like the elite Imperials. The fuckers could not hit the backside of a barn. I saw a, a Halloween cartoon with somebody dressed as a stormtrooper dropping candy and missing the bag. The kid was holding out. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh, a stormtrooper red shirt. Hmm. Let's, let's. I've seen that meme. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely going to shoot themselves. That's how that works. <laughs> the, dragging this back to, to side plots. There's a number of ways you can do it. Don't feel constrained to try and do it a certain way or to keep it limited in scope. Sometimes its scope becomes as large as the main short, the main story plot itself. Just have fun with it and just realize that you've got to bring it all to a close at the end of the novel. <sighs> I guess we should speak about short stories with it. Side plots, <laughs> side plots don't have much of a place 
in short stories. Subplots have almost no place in a short story. <laughs> if you're introducing subplots in your short story, you're writing a novel. The, <laughs> welcome to the novella. <laughs> That's how Paul ends up with epic short stories. Epic short stories. It is the ten. Like I said, the tendency is going. I think toward people looking at their word counts and going, "I need something else to happen, or I'm just going to have a twenty thousand word book." You said that earlier. Mm -hmm. I have said that before, and then I end up with something like closet treats, or I say something like that and end up with fucking derelict. The way it ends up for me as I'm writing a novel is I'll write a good long stretch and then I'll have a massive event happens that just changes the course and sends the story shooting off in a different direction. And that's the kind of stories that you write. Those that's the, the kind of stories I write. That doesn't even, I use subplots to make those happen, but I already know that it's going to happen. I use them like, imagine like, somebody hitting a the playing billiards and the ball striking one another subplots bouncing around the story. That's kind of how it works for me. Sometimes is the subplot will come along and knock the main storyline off course. And then your people are in hell trying to figure out how to get back to what they were doing in the first place. They're never going to get back. <laughs> <laughs> never going to happen. No, they end up in their own series completely separate. <laughs> also been known to happen. <laughs> also been known to happen. Yes. <laughs> absolutely absolutely it's like looking at, let's look at subplots with something like the dresden files oh christ harry can be trying to find this demon and jim butcher is just adding in complication after complication from his personal life and his professional life that are all just vying to overwhelm this character yeah, suddenly he has the uh, the black uh, witch coven, whatever they're called. There's red, white, and black, and I can't remember the houses. Ah, yeah, the vampires. The, the vampires. Houses. The the vampires. vampires. Uh, he's trying to, I can't even remember what it was he was trying to do. He was trying to do something on the main subplot, but then he keeps running into these folks over and over and over again. And doesn't he realize that they are part of the main plot? <laughs> They've got their own agenda, and they keep running into him, and he's like, why are we meeting like why this? Why are we meeting? <laughs> why are you burning my hands off? Why are you doing these horrible things? What are you Who, doing here? It's it's there's a scene to, to, to totally change it away from Dresden Files in one of the Mission Impossible movies. Uh, Ethan Hunt has been captured by the bad guys, and they've got him strung up in this room, and he's talking to the people that are holding him that are about to torture him, and suddenly one of the people that's there with the bad guys starts beating the hell out of the other bad guys. And in the process tosses him the key to get himself loose from that. And, and when they finally got all the bodies knocked down and they're standing there looking at each other, it's like, have we met? Who the hell are you? <laughs> who, who are you? They don't actually explain who she is in that for a while, but it was like, have we met before? <laughs> And those those are also good moments to have, but having those subplots in there can it can be part of the main plot. Just just they're going a circuitous route to it. Sure. So I I try I try not to think plots of a straight line. I think more of them like a three D graphic of a mountain range. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get them from point A to point Z, but here's all the different peaks and troughs we're going to visit on our way there. I see mine as chaos and entropy spun together. And about the three quarter mark, I go, there's the end. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's an end. Where the hell's the end? How do I wrap this up? Okay. This is what I do. <laughs> we, we had, we had someone ask on, on the uh, Facebook group, how do you find the end? I think we covered that in endings, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it is damn difficult because you have gotten everything so crazy that you have to somehow manage to make a believable intersection to just go ahead and end the damn book. Sometimes you got so much shit up in the air. You're like, how do I make this movie not end like Armageddon? Yeah, exactly. Not end the just absolute stupid. <laughs> 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 I 
or make everything just a little too convenient for for everybody involved. Oh, there's a little Deus Ex Machina going on over there. You basically write Stan Lee in doing something at the end of your book. Is that Stan Lee? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's Stan Lee. <laughs> it was the Force, Luke. The Force did all this. Yeah, likely story. I think that that's one of the problems I've had with a couple of books I've read recently is the the conclusions. The subplots were really shallow. And the book felt way too short. The book was only, I guess, 80,000 words. And I think it was 10,000 words of freaking research notes. So it was really a short novel. And I was really disappointed because we didn't have time to really get to know these people other than a sketch. And then things were too easy, too predictable. There weren't any massive subplots or anything else to to really add texture to the story. And I was like, this is a New York Times bestseller? you got to be fucking kidding me. Subplots are a writer's way of tripping the main character. And you should use it. Things cannot work out well all the time for the main character. You've got to have try-fail cycles. And subplots are a great way to derail a main character from succeeding in something. Yes. Yes, they are. A whole failure of an electrical system. We have to get past this electrical system to get on the other side of the ship, which is where all the shit that we need to do. So now we need to go fix the goddamn electrical system. Whole new monsters this way. It's like it's like basically a big sign for me that says monsters this way, new monsters, new information this way. Oh, great. Let's see. This basically, when you, when you start a new subplot, all I can see is a character going, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I haven't used the, what are we supposed to do? Use harsh language? I don't think I've used that yet in this book, but I know it's going to show up. <laughs> I know it's going to show up in Derelict at some point. What are we supposed to use? Harsh language? I could also have that line in TV4. Yes. <laughs> Make a note. Make a note. I'm editing. Put this back in there. Channel Bill Paxton. Is Bill Paxton, right? Yeah, Bill Pullman's the other guy. I always get those two names confused. I don't know why. I don't know why that is. So any final words on side plots? Subplots and side plots are necessary. And you need to learn how to use them if you don't know how. If you have never created one, look for a place to do it and just do it. If you've never created a subplot before, you're lying. You have created one. You just, <laughs> you just haven't recognize recognized it. it. Yeah, you haven't recognized it. Everyone does it. Everyone has a, but meanwhile, <laughs> moment meanwhile, going on back at the story. farm. Yeah. There, there's always opportunities to use it. You just need to, I wouldn't search out ways to use it because they'll find you. But you when write you write a murder novel at Balticon, you could have a ton of subplots there. Oh God. Too many to count. The, uh, <laughs> way too many to count. <laughs> Let's say horrible things to me like that because I might just do it. The, you know, the subplots really make it... That's what gives us time to get to know the characters. That's what times to, That's when we get to see all the reactions, all the emotions that are bottled, bottled up about whatever the main plot is doing because they drag that baggage in with them. And it's a chance for you to reshuffle the baggage and send them back out. It's a chance for you to make those characters shine. Give them moments that really highlight them in those subplots, because not everything is the heroic hero standing up and fighting for life, liberty, justice, and all. It's also getting into a fist fight in a bar. Yeah, yes. Or the, the, the hand grenade that shows up for no damn reason. Here, hold this. Holy <laughs> fuck, where did this come from? <laughs> Which brings you to the realization, yes, you are hanging out and drinking with an arms dealer. <laughs> Suddenly, subplot galore. <laughs> that would be awesome. Like, oh, I got something here I think will help. Just hand a guy a grenade. <laughs> Where the fuck did you get this? <laughs> that's a totally different story. I always now. carry three or four of my jackets. That's see, that's 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 another intersection of somebody else's story into yours. I don't have time for that right now. Uh, Use it in good health, bud. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't have time for this. <laughs> I gotta be somewhere. Who the fuck was that guy? <laughs> Yes, 
Exactly. That would be an awesome thing to have in, in a story. I'm going to have to see if I could come up with a place to have something like that. Oh, I'm sure you will. Have an obvious group of other heroes show up in the midst of whatever storyline they're in. Just pass it through. <laughs> make way, make way. That's one thing I've really missed about all the uh, writing with the black and derelict is to have a chance for the characters to really sit down and have a beer. <laughs> Because, damn, they need it. <laughs> alcohol. We need alcohol. And maybe something a lot stronger. There's a movie. I can't even remember what it is. It's about hunting some kind of monsters down in a subway tunnel. And all the while, the, the main characters are talking. We've got to do this. We've got to do this. Do this. The side characters over there looking at the guns on the wall going, I need a bigger gun. I need a bigger gun. I, I, we need bigger guns. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the side character is doing. That there's a bunch of plot lines for you. There's a bunch of books I just book ideas I just threw out. Yep. We're gonna need a bigger bigger X. Okay. Why do they need a bigger X? Oh, there's your story. Mm -hmm. Warning, plot complication. Warning, Warning plot, plot complication, complication ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hazardous area, plot monsters may bite. Ah, <sighs> so exciting. Yeah. And I'm about right. to start a novel. I can't wait. I just today started static. So, uh, yeah, I'm well on my way. You know, I think I'm going to totally do that on the way. A funny thing happened on the way to Terra. That's <laughs> going to be my side plot. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Whatever. <laughs> I, I totally am going to have one of the sets of characters run into some arms dealers, obviously in the middle of their own story. And have them going, who are those guys? <laughs> Where the hell did they come from? And what the fuck are they doing now? And this is how we get TV series. You're a bad man. Very bad hey, man. If you're going to have a spinoff, you got to start it somewhere, right? Well, this is true. You have to, to, you have to off the spin. <laughs> I'll, I'll shut up now. Minnie has taken over. So why don't you close the show out? That's right. Minnie says, we're done podcasting. It's over now. You may love me. <laughs> if you would like to tell us what you think about side plots, subplots, side pieces, whatever you want to talk about, send us, a <laughs> send us a note at show at deadrobotsociety.com. You can find Paul on Twitter at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. You can find us on Facebook at the listeners of the Dead listeners of the dead robots society on facebook you can find us on youtube at youtube.com slash drs podcast if you would like to become a patron of the show you can find us on patreon.com forward slash drs podcast wherefore as little as a dollar a month you can get exclusive content and and even if you go a little higher you can be mentioned every single show as one of our patrons. Finally, we have to thank the good folks at podhoster.com who host all of the audio episodes for your ear holes. Paul, who are our $10 patrons? All right. Our $10 patrons this week are Sue Bayman, JD Barker, Kelson Deal, Ghostly Ghouls Gather Gleefully to Golf on Ghostly Golf C, golf course, I assume, Isabel Cushy, Rick Shaw, Lisa Slack, Sandy Manpants, Cheryl Winters, Tracy Bodine, John Kilgallen, Devin Lee, Drew is still at ludicrous speed, Bernardi, Chris Winder, Andre Conde Moraes, DJ Chamberlain, and J.R. Handley. Thanks for supporting us, folks. We deeply appreciate it, and you make it possible for this show to continue operating. Yes, thank you very much. So, Paul, I think this is where we say goodbye. This is where we say goodbye. So how, how many more freaking uh, uh, words do you think I'll have by the next time we get together? Hmm, since I'm not going to be here next week, you could uh, be halfway through your novel by the time I talk to you again. Mm, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Remember, leprechauns. Leprechauns. Why are you saying leprechauns to me? Because, obviously, that's a, a side plot you need to have in this novel. There leprechauns. will be no freaking leprechauns. <laughs> Bye, Terry. Bye, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>